Hi, in today's video, I'm going to have a childhood friend, Kevin Butts, join me. And we're going to have a conversation about credit, credit reports, free credit reports, the credit score model, and just the different things that impact the credit score model, as well as some tips of what maybe some actions that you can take if you were neg negatively impacted by the last year. So if you're new to my channel, I'm Sherry from SherryLaMiller.com, and here on this channel we talk about mindset, intentional choices, actions, and habits, and how those impact the financial flexibility in your budget. Now occasionally I will do how-to videos, all things that are typically related to earning more, spending less, saving automatically, or just living your life by design. So credit has an impact on our life. Some people are better with it than others, but overall, we pretty much need credit to do certain things in our life, and our credit score impacts that. It impacts the interest rates that we um, are charged. It impacts our insurance rates. So it's just good to have a general understanding now today is going to be kind of broad and then we may do future videos to kind of be more specific about different things that comprise the um, credit scores but today we're going to throw a broad net and let's get started kevin's going to introduce himself and then we're going to get going with the conversation okay so i have kevin here with me today i'm going to let him introduce himself well, hello. Well, hello, everyone. You know, Kevin Butts, that's uh, B-U-T-T-S. And uh, I'm definitely excited, located here in Michigan, as they say, Detroit, Michigan. And uh, it's been a whirlwind as far as my career um, working um, in terms of being like a credit, a person with a lot of knowledge in terms of credit. So what first thing I'll say is that anybody can do credit repair. I mean, you can research, you can buy a book. I mean, they got courses out here now that if someone wants to have a credit repair business, people can do that. But now when you do credit education, that's different. So now you got to have a professional experience, which I have about 15 years. You know, I do have my degree in finance and then the formal training. So now with the professional experience where I approve people for cars and mortgages and credit cards and did debt consolidation where you had to dissect and analyze credit reports, looking at credit reports all day, every day. So it's nothing pretty much that I didn't get a chance to see and observe. So when you work in the industry, you're able to talk about things only that you can talk about because you were in the industry. Now, some people can give you know good information I always say give and get good information, but you want people to have strategies. And I say credit education, credit repair, if you've got some issues and stuff like that, but the education, that means that you can maintain it, you can manage it yourself, you kind of know what to do. We get limited information in terms of credit. And I always say just because you work at a bank for 10, 15 years, no disrespect, but you got one perspective. Yeah. And, that's a, and that's a banking perspective. Someone in the credit industry, they're going to have a, a little different dynamic. And then with my experience, I had like four or five different jobs. So what that mean, I was a credit manager, a credit analyst, a special finance manager at a dealership and a branch manager. And at one time, Sherry, you know, I, I did it. I was in between jobs and you know how life, you know, some things took some turns. And yeah. so I took a pay cut. And I worked in the uh, third party debt collections, bill collectors. Fascinating. So you had I to go. I kind of want to touch on that a little bit, you know, where you said the original and the third party. Like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, I want to touch on that too. And then you have people on, you know, YouTube and social media. And, and when I listen to them, I, I don't chuckle. I just kind of listen to them. And sometimes they give some good basic information, you know, Fair Debt Collection Practice Act and our rights as a consumer. But when you work at a place like that, and you go through the formal training, you get into things like, well, if something's on my credit report, it has to fall off in seven years. Well, no, that's not true. Cause you do have the original creditor in the third party. So how is the original creditor reporting? So that's very, very important. So whoever initiates that, that debt, 
that loan, they're the original creditor. Now, when it gets sold to a third party, they assume all the legal rights. And there are certain laws that protect us, you know, in terms of, you know, when it's sold to a third party, and you got things that your limitation, you know, debt validation, you know, should I pay off a collection, uh, depending upon how old it is. So you, you, hope you have an array of issues and a lot of stuff is out there. But once again, I mean, that's something that I can, um, that I have some insight to and getting back to what I said earlier, uh, Sherry, I always, when I first started, so not just three and four years ago. Okay. I've been out uh -huh. here, I've been <laughs> out here about 15 years. Okay. And I, you know, I thank God for that. So, but when I worked in the industry, I quickly noticed how little people knew about credit. And I'm not talking about just someone that had like a low income. I'm talking about it didn't discriminate. Uh, right. Master's degrees, bachelor's degrees. I mean, people making really good money. First thing they say most people just concern themselves with their score. And see now, see that's a great point. So here now, you're gonna love this year. <laughs> always say now you're gonna really love this so I always say when i ask him when i say well how's your credit i don't want him to say bad because when you say bad then i always that translates into okay now you're starting to exhibit bad credit behavior like well you know it's already messed up you know i ain't gonna really worry about it but i would always say and this is so key when i look at look at a credit report i break it down into time periods and i look at okay what's going on with you seven years ago you were kind of okay. Five years ago, four years ago, you were perfect. Within three years, okay, loss of job, some went on. So when you look at the time periods, I would say your score doesn't match your history. So, and that will give people life like, okay, now anything in the last two, two years is gonna have more of an impact on your score. Anything in the last two years. Okay, now if it's five and six years ago, you don't let someone look at your credit report, and they do this in the industry, they'll nitpick to justify charging you a higher interest rate. Right. Because, we, because we know in the industry, it's like, and I tell young folks this too, if you have a really good score, you're getting good interest rates. But now I always say, well, I say, well, how's your credit? Well, I got good credit. I say, what do you mean by that? I get approved for everything. But are so you- So are, let me stop you for right there. So what, with your knowledge, in this day and age right now, what is good credit? Like what score range? I would say, well, naturally I would say 750 and higher, you know, 750 and higher. I mean, it used to be before the credit crisis, you know, with the, with the foreclosure crisis and the credit crisis, yeah. you remember back in the day, Sherry, if you had 600, you was like, woo. You know, <laughs> if you was in the 600, you was like, oh, like, okay, it's on and popping. And, and you can get a cool. I mean, you get approved for anything, you get approved. right? You know, but all, and, and I always tell people this, sometimes you may be, let's say in the, in the high five hundreds or the high or the low six hundreds. So I would tell people even in the five hundreds, well, how's your credit? Well, you know, it's kind of bad. It's kind of messed up. I say, well, no, your score doesn't match your history. I see four years ago on your credit report that you paid for a car. I see uh, five years ago, you had a credit card that was $3,000 and you paid it off. So what I always tell people, when someone says, well, how's your credit? You, now you're gonna like this here. I always say, well, how's your credit? I have a very respectable history. It just doesn't match my score. Cause your credit report is used to examine, you know, if you're trying to do something, but your score determines your rate. So right. what I tell people that, and then for some people that got like a, you know, maybe like a 680 or 690 or 700 will traditionally get approved for everything. Sometimes I'll tell them, okay, you get approved for everything, but you're not in, you're not getting the best rates. Right. You know, because sometimes see in the, in the industry, you know, sure they have tier systems. So it's like a tier one, tier two, tier three, or A plus, A, B, C. So now if you a B, if you a B and you're getting approved for everything, let's say you five points away from an A. I've seen people just say they don't really concern themselves as long as they're getting approved. Let's say you got 6% as a B, but at the next level, the next tier, you can get 4%. That's a 2.2 interest rate drop. Spread, yeah. And let's say you buy, you're getting a mortgage or you buying a house. So some people, they strategically say, but now here's the key. If you understand the credit score model, you can say, okay, where can I find 15 points? 
Well, let's go over that. Let's start there, like with the model. Like, so how would, cause, you know, with us coming out of COVID and people's score may have been impacted during all of this. So is that where they should look first, like understand the model of the, of the credit score model? Well, see, when you mentioned before, or, you know, I, I need to, well, I think, and, uh, I'll just go ahead and say it. I mean, it's all well, good. My wife always say, you know, I need to copyright this, this intellectual property, but I always say, <laughs> you know, credit score management principles to learn how to manage your score. So just real quick, and I have it verbatim in my heart, you know, the credit score model, 35% of your score is pay history. 30% is available credit. 15% is a length of history. The other 10% is inquiries and opening dates. And the other 10% is a mix of credit. Mix of credit mean what kind of accounts do you have on your report? Let's say you had to reestablish. So I've seen people after bankruptcy, and I use my wife and Sherry, and Sherry knows this too. You know, we well, I had to reestablish. I mean, when I filed after the crisis, because I worked in financial services, so I filed in 2010, I think, and it tanked. Right. I mean, it was whatever. I don't remember exactly what it was. It was like five something. Right. And I told people I had to get those high interest rate where you get like five hundred dollars just to reestablish my history. Just see, Sarah, you you're gonna like this also. I always tell people it's not a crime in the sense of file bankruptcy, but what happens is the day you get discharged is the day you start to reestablish. But now when you reestablish, it's got to be strategic based on the model because the model says 10% of your score is a mix of credit. So just for example, a credit card for most of us, it's a credit card. And like I tell high school students, but a credit card is a revolving account. Okay, now a car loan is an installment account. So the credit score model says, you can't be disproportionately out of balance. I never forget a guy I was working at the credit union, my other position, I was a senior loan officer. And I always jokingly say, I wasn't a junior loan officer, I wasn't a sophomore loan officer, or fresh, I was a senior loan officer. So this guy came in, you know, guy had his own business, he was making money. So, but he was trying to get a car, I think increase his equity line in his house. So when I pulled his credit, his score was 660. Perfect pay history had never missed a payment on nothing. I'm, I'm like baffled. So me, I said, let me stop. Let me keep analyzing and seeing kind of what's going on. And mm -hmm. then I picked up on it. Sherry, he had about between 15 and 18 credit cards. But here's the thing. They wasn't all maxed out. He was one of those guys that knew he had good credit. So whenever he Just went somewhere, right. So whenever he went somewhere, he was offering 10% <laughs> discount or if he wanted to get a credit card and, 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 and buy something. And then when his money came in from his business, he was write a check and just pay it off. But then I figured out he was disproportionately out of balance in terms of revolving versus installment. That means he had too many revolving accounts. Then it, lead, then it led to closing accounts. Some people know the basics of you know, closing an account, but when you're closing an account, you have to be strategic and decide which ones you want to close. And then you can't close them all at once. Like you can't open up a lot, all, a lot of things all at once. Like people do those tricks that, yeah, man, you can go out and get a vehicle. You can buy two, three cars within 30 days before it hits your credit report. So with the credit score model, if you had to close something, you have to be strategic in terms of which ones I'm gonna close. So you should probably keep the ones that have been long, open the longest. There you go, Sherry. There you go. And with, with, a, with a low limit, Okay. The ones, the ones with the lower limit. Cause see, let's go ahead and talk about it. I mean, this, 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 this is us. And my thing is I've always been about, you know, sharing, you know, my knowledge It's a blessing and working in corporate America. And when I stepped out on faith, you know, it was really knowing that I could really help people because having all the knowledge, I see getting the inside information of how this stuff works. And then when I would educate people, it was so empowering because once I gave them the principles and strategies, they will come back and say, wow, oh my goodness, Kevin. So it's like after you file bankruptcy, so now I know how to manage it, sustain it, protect it. And then the real quick, because it's, it's still in my mind is that, you know, 15% of your score is a length of history. So if you're closing things, it's not what Kevin says, it's what the model says. Yeah. 
So, and this is so fascinating, Sherry. So a guy works at a bank, right? So, you know, doing a foreclosure crisis, you know, you know how people will refinance your home to pay off some credit cards. And they will go to the bank and who, the, the company to, that was holding more at their banker and they say, well, hey, I want to refinance my house. We'll take out an equity line and pay off some credit cards. They like, sure. So they pay off the credit cards and they don't close them. Then let's say three years later, they're back. And they want to increase the equity lines. They don't charge the cars back up. Then the banker tells them that, well, you still got some equity in your home, um, but you need to close some of those cars. Fine with me. I, I, I'm, I'm just going to keep one. Fine with me. I'll close them because now they're trying to get that money to pay them off. Right. But then I told him, I said, well, why would you tell them that? He said, well, Kevin, you know, they can go charge it back up. I said, but now you're talking about a debt to income ratio issue. Right. But a credit score model issue says 15% of your score is a length of history. So if you opened up an account in 2008 and 2018, and let's say 2021, and you closed the one in 2008 and 2018, the scoring model is going to recognize your next oldest account, which is 2021. So now you lose all that history. All the history. So I told him, I say, you know, that's a debt to income ratio issue, a banking perspective. But on my side, a credit side and a credit, not a credit education person, I'm like, you don't need to tell people that. And, oh, and then, you know, and, and then maybe next time we'll be able to go into details like, and I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead and do it now because we can go back over it. Well, I wanted to, because you said 35% was um payment history. Right. So coming out of, I don't think we're allowed to say the word on YouTube. Coming out of this crisis, right. people's credit history probably has been impacted. And that's the largest percentage, right? Well, Siri, so that's a great point. I was thinking when you told me that. So the first thing I would do, we know that we can write the credit reporting agencies a note or a letter up to 100 words. You know how sometimes we've seen people, what I've seen, I should say, at the bottom of their credit report, it will say something like, before you extend credit, give me a call. Here's my number. Because, you know, you, you don't have to pay for credit monitoring and ID for services. I don't say don't do that because they, they're good in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. But as consumers, we do have the right to add up to 100 words at the bottom of our credit report. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So now, and this is, I mean, and it's a great point you bring to the table, Sherry, because now what we can do initially, and I'll go to a second point. Okay. Initially, we can write the credit reporting agencies and say, hey, because of COVID, and being um, not employed, not able to make some payments, that's the reason of some delinquencies on my credit report. The fascinating thing, Sherry, is that if someone sat in front of me and I asked them about their credit report and they told me, Kevin, I, I lost my job or I went through a divorce, and if your story can match your report and I saw some other things, you were okay, okay, then I probably would, would approve you. But you can't come in there saying, well, I don't know, I don't know what happened. And it was just one of those things. And I think for some people, this can be something that we may need to get out here more of a message for people during these unprecedented times. And we can say, well, hey, look, you can write a letter up to 100 words just saying that in that way, if someone pulls it, they automatically see it. So if you have any face-to-face -face -face interaction with them or a phone call with them, they're gonna immediately see that. So now your story has to match your history. Now we get to the point where what can I do? You do have to get your credit report if you call to make some arrangements. And we always say annualcreditreport.com. That's, yeah, the, that's the one I use. That's the website. And guess what, Sherry? I can see you on point. That's the only one that'll give you a file number and a confirmation number. See, people, you know, you, you can't just go to some of these. You, you can't call and say, I want to do a dispute or what's this on my credit report or you have a question the first thing they're going to say is do you have a file number do you have a confirmation number so you have to always use annualcreditreport.com and then that way they'll give you a file number confirmation number you can do a dispute online so the first thing's first that because of the because of this this unprecedented time we're living in if you had some arrangements with your creditors you want to make sure nothing didn't slip through the cracks and see how it's reporting 
Sherry, we may we may we may have to do another one like this. This this may be something because you know well, I was making a note so I can put a link in the comp uh, in the section about the annual credit report. Yeah, said, that's the one I use. But I think a lot of people use Credit Karma and Credit Sesame for a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, and, I mean, and that's cool. It's an additional service. Yeah, you know, this this is the one that's endorsed by the federal government. By the government, right? Yeah, that was endorsed by Barack Obama and other presidents. You know, George. Because did George it Bush. come out around the crisis? Because I thought it kind of well, came. It came out probably when Bush was president, because Bush was oh, okay. The, Bush was the first to have the president's advisory council for financial capability, and then you know, I think maybe twenty years ago we some consumer advocate groups you know sued the credit reporting agencies to allow access to our score do you know just in the last 20 plus years we've just been given access to our scores i know because you used to couldn't i would have to get people to tell me right. like i knew people like 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 you that were in the credit right. like what's my score you're yeah. right i didn't realize it was that long ago right. but it wasn't readily available to you the consumer advocates had to fight like wait a minute this this number and this these credit reports everywhere you turn they want to pull your report you mean to tell me we can't have access to our score so they they were sued and then eventually they had to relinquish but like you say with the annual credit report because i mean you make you make a great point when i was thinking before i want to make sure i don't, I don't lose this train of thought you know during these unprecedented times i say go get your credit report to make sure that if you have any if you made some payment arrangements and and they said they were going to defer or suspend some payments you want to make sure how is that looking on your on your credit report because i don't i don't mind telling people i'm like look you know me and my wife do you know very well but then you know when when a credit crisis you know hit i'm like okay uh one of my bills i'm like okay i'm because i guess the initial shock of everything and i and i can say to say i don't know about we, we didn't panic but i'm like you know we, we obviously you know we didn't panic i just went into survival mode i'm like yeah, we went okay. into survival. i mean we were able to you know <laughs> praise god i mean kind of you know make our payments but it was like you know okay you know let's call and everybody was very very flexible and say you can skip you know three months you can defer it and what have you and you know so but the main thing is we still want to be able to get our reports to make sure that it did report the way it should have reported and not impact your score because real quick i had a guy you know uh, one of my mentors uh, which is a program i'm involved in he called me and said he had an equity line a very successful guy. He had an equity line and he even called his bank and said, Hey, you know, I want to suspend, you know, some of my equity line payments. They say, well, okay, sure. But the bank that they, that his mortgage is with for the equity line share, they were dealing with a third party uh, servicing company. They sold it probably. Right. So what happened, they somehow it slipped through the cracks and it was showing him delinquent. Can you believe that? See, and that's what, because I said, I was trying to wait for everything to settle down before right. I pulled mine, because right. like, like you, like as soon as um, it became real, like, you know, stuff started shutting down, like, you know, I'm in Vegas, casinos started closing down. I called because like we talked before, when you have all that money going out and you don't have anything coming in, because my income was impacted. Yeah, so exactly, like, you too, right. Yeah, so I was like, okay, I'm 100% self-employed. So I'm going into self-preservation mode. Right. Me too. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm 100%. You know, my wife works, but I'm, I'm 100%, you know, entrepreneur, you know, self-employed. And like you said before, I had like three projects I was working on. And, you know, I'm all excited, getting ready to make a few more moves and put the brakes on, like, you know, skirt, and like cancel. We can't do anything. I went months with, I mean, I, I think it was about three months. I had no income coming in. Right. So, and, and yeah. you know, in the beginning, the market crashed. So you don't want to sell on a fire right. sale. So right. I'm like, okay, I got to limit the amount of money I got going out. That, that, so. that, see, that's, that, that's the key thing. I think, you know, for us, it was almost like, yes, we can pay it. And yes, you know, praise God, if we had to go and tap into our savings or what have you, but everything was, it was so many things racing. But like you say, for us, and I've been an entrepreneur, survival mode is like, you know what? Okay, let me limit what's kind of going. If I have to, if it gets to that point, and that's what I have to do, okay, I'm going to do what I have to do. But now I don't mind right now to have a, a temporary suspension. Right. And the thing was, like, like you said, most were accommodating because right. it was 
unprecedented times for everybody. I mean, they couldn't do it long term because they're right. in the business to make money. Right. But, <laughs> but initially, right. for the most part, I think I got a three month grace. It was like two to three months, depending yeah, on what right. it was. But yeah. it helped to not even the stress of it, like to not have to worry about it. That was Sherry. I mean, I, I mean, it, it's such a great point because I mean, as a matter of fact, we had a couple, you know, where now we did we did a, a like a deferment. But now this is really fascinating right here. So let's say obviously for those who have a mortgage. So the mortgage industry, you know, they decided to do uh, deferments. Yeah, I remember. So only a couple of lending institutions made the decision to suspend payments. So now if you suspended the payments, you would, they would put it on the back of the loan. Yeah. The deferment, um, no, the, the forbearance, my bad. The forbearance, forbearance, yeah. So we did a forbearance. It was like um, you could skip a couple of months and when the forbearance was over, you had to pay all, all of it, right? All. So initially, you know, we were like, okay, well, let's go ahead and do a, um, of um, deferment on, on the mortgage. So we say, fine. So we put the paperwork in, everything kind of go through. And with my knowledge, I'm just thinking this is a deferment. So Scott was talking to one of her friends. She was like, yeah, girl, you know, we're not, we not doing no, de no, no deferment. She said, well, no, we're we doing a, um, you know, we're not doing no, uh, for, we're not doing a forbearance. She said, well, yeah, you know, we're doing a deferment. She said, are you sure? She said, you the call, make sure your, your deferment is not no forbearance. Because we thought it was a uh, deferment. And we called them. And they said, yeah, we have you in the system for a forbearance. We say, oh, wait a minute. We say, no, you can take that off. We will do what we have to do. So we had to call and have them, like, you know, cancel the uh, forbearance. Because we were in the, it's, oh, and Scott was talking, because she, I didn't talk to the people. You know, so forbearance, so like when that was over, you had to pay all the back payments at once, right? Right. Yeah, I was seeing some horror stories on the internet. Right. You know, so for me, I explained it to her. So I'm like, in retrospect, I should have been on a call, you know, and, and I should have talked to him. But I'm like, okay, babe, you know, I was doing some, okay, babe, just go ahead and tell him, you know, kind of what we're going to do. And I was kind of coaching her what to say. So, okay, you know, I got it. And the person kind of, and she admitted to me, my wife, that they were kind of vague. Like, you know, it was almost like, um, yeah, it, it made her feel, Sherry, that it was a deferment. Right. The way they communicated to her. They didn't tell her anything about after three months, you got to pay it all back. And it's, they yeah. didn't mention nothing. And then, so I kind of, I didn't, I didn't like that. Because, you know, my thing was, they know that, okay, oh yeah, you can suspend it for three months, but we're going to get all our money. That, that's, I mean, that's a win for them. I mean, because it's like you're making payments. But after three months, you get it all back anyway. So I was kind of a little disappointed. I told him, I said, to me, that was poor customer service. That you really didn't explain to my wife. And you had her thinking. It was, and then when I did even more research, you know, you know, Fannie Mae, I kept monitoring their website, kept monitoring their website. The only thing that disappoints me about our country is that universally, they did not have a national um, deferment for mortgages. During, during, during this crisis right. because because it's kind of deep because the uh, mortgages they're insured so the mortgage companies they have to pay insurance so now if you do the deferment that's uh, uh, a big loss and then with Fannie Mae being you know federally backed right. you know so there, there it was a money issue in terms of folks having insurance on those mortgages and I felt like it would have been a big economic impact, you know, for the federal government and, and other big time lending institutions. But I thought that in America, you know, and, and in some ways they can, it could have kind of disrupt the mortgage industry a little bit. If that massive amount of payments would have been suspended. Suspended, yeah. But that was kind of unfortunate because of our economic system. But I thought that was really unfair. And I thought universally everyone should have been able to do a deferment. And you had some individual. Well, the plan. reason after the 2008, 2009, because I'm renting, like I didn't really find, I, I would see different things online. Right. But you didn't want people to go into a foreclosure crisis. Right. Because, yeah. what, because I told people the difference between what we were in now in 2008, 2009, 
it was primarily the housing market. Right. That's what was impacted. Right. But I was like, this time, everything shut down. Oh, yeah. So if you have a, a foreclosure crisis on top of the economy is bad right. because everything is impacted, I was like, it'll make 2008, 2009 look pretty good. Right. Because people couldn't wrap their heads around it. I was like, no, we're talking about the economy this time. Right. Not, not a sector. Well, Sherry, so you just gave a, a very compelling analysis because that's when the federal government said, we got to send out some stimulus checks. <laughs> we got to get this stuff under control. We got to, we got to, we, you know, we're, we're, we are, we're a consumption based economy, we're consumption, you know, so, yeah. you know, it's based on spending. I mean, capitalism. I think somebody said like 80%. I think the Fed spoke and said, that's why they wanted continuous payments because it wasn't enough money flowing into the economy. Right. So like, I mean, you, you I mean, you, you painted the picture. So, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's like when, throughout the history of our country and we know the challenges that we have and being a very rich country, how we can contribute to helping folks uh, get a, get a, get a leg up and not just, you know, you want to, you want to be able to, you know, help people and why, let's help Americans. When, when this, when this, when this crisis hit, that's the first time in our history we ever seen the government say, we gonna send y'all some money. We gonna, <laughs> we gonna, and it really wasn't, Oh, and what? This is so fascinating, Sherry. So watch this. So one of the guys, even on television, he said, he didn't say the first thing came out of his mouth. It wasn't like, yeah, you know, we're going to send the stimulus out because, you know, Americans are hurting and, you know, we want to make sure that we take care of people, you know, Americans. He said, we want to put some money out here so people can, can go spend. Well, you have to because right. even my sister, we got into this big debate and, I mean, I haven't taken econ since college. I'm not going to lie. And that was a long right. time ago. But I was like, it's supply, like money has to start flowing. And here's the thing, Kevin, this is when I knew things were, we're gonna got off topic, but anyway, this is when I knew it was bad, is when they ran out of coins. When you went and they were like, we don't have coins. I was like, when the heck have we ever? Hey, Sherry, or, Sherry, or, or they said, it, if, if you have, please use some change, we, we need change. <laughs> But my bank actually, it was a couple of stores. They were like, if you gave them, didn't give them the exact change, they couldn't give you change back. They were encouraging you to use your debit card because they didn't. Right. And I was like, okay, right. like this is on a whole different level. Yeah. So that's why I kind of today, and like you said, you, we can come back another time. Right. Was because I think everybody, I didn't really have a problem with everybody getting a stimulus check. Right. Like some people had a problem. Well, they didn't lose their job. And I told people, if you go to the grocery store, prices were going up. Everybody was impacted at some level, whether they lost their jobs or not. Right. It was, you know, it was various degrees. Some people got hit really hard and other people, you know, it did affect their household income. Because me and a friend of mine, we got into a big debate because she was like, well, she's still getting her retirement pension checks. I said, but it's not going as far. Right. Because, you know, the cost of things have gone up. Right. So it's so I didn't have a problem, but I told her the biggest thing is the money has to start flowing. I was like, right. if we're going to come out of this and we're going to save the economy, it has to start flowing. And if people like if they lost their job, because a lot of people got hung up in different parts of, of assistance, mm -hmm. went a long time without any help. That's true. So that's kind of why I wanted to talk about the credit, because you could have had somebody that had a really good job at the beginning of 2020, mm -hmm. but maybe their entire company closed, whatever happened, they're no longer employed. True. So they had really good credit, but now through no fault of their own, they can't make their payments anymore. Right. Even after the three months that the companies gave, that was a good thing, it helped them, but at the end of three months, they still don't have any money coming in. So that's why I kind of like wanted you to come on and we just talk about like how credit like works so people can see what is it that I do going forward. So the whole thing about the note, I didn't know that. So to put a note on your credit to right. say like, this is what happened, like during this time period, I couldn't do what I normally do. It's so, be, because yeah. that way, because you remember when when something goes to any um, creditor, I mean, 
most don't, they're, they're pretty much only going to go by everything is score driven first. And that's one of was one of my criticisms when I, you know, when I was in the industry, I always analyzed somebody's credit report before I went to the score. But you have people out here, they're so score driven. They don't look at the circumstances, time periods. And a lot of times people end up getting denied. And then sometimes disproportionately people get, you know, um, left on the wrong side of the fence. So what I always say is, you know, you know, you know, with, with the crisis that we hit, and then we know that a lot of people's scores were hit hard. So the one thing I would do, if anybody has to pull my credit report, I want them to see out the gate what I've been through. I don't want you to make any assumptions. I want to be very, very clear. Then that way, even when you get in front of people, Sherry, even when it gets to a point where you're having a um, a call and, you know, like a phone call, a conference call with a creditor, or eventually you, you got to go in and sit down and have your mask on and talk to them. So now you can use that to kind of leverage and get their mind off your score. If you're trying to really make a move and something's really important, then because now the circumstances matches my situation. And I always say this, when I made an exception, it was based on the circumstances, the story. Right. So now I would not just be arrogant and bold like some people would be. It's like, turn them down, you know, nope, your score is this and this and that. Now, because the one thing about the credit scoring model that I think is not fair is that with 35% of your score being pay, pay, pay history, you mean to tell me, uh, Sherry, in the history of somebody's life, they can never, ever, ever, ever go 30 days. I mean, just life in general. Now, if you're talking 30 years ago, maybe 40 years ago, 50 years ago, when you we, we're from Detroit, so you can you can you, you know the story. You can leave Chrysler Friday or get fired, and then get hired at Ford. You know, on Monday, right. the, story, the story our older relatives would tell us. But then also, you know, in America, it's like you know you didn't have to worry about being without a job. But then just just the different aspects of life, divorce lost a job, got sick, you're going to have... Life happens. Life, life happens. So, But you mean to tell me this credit score model tells us if you miss one payment, one payment, it can drop your score 40, 50, 60 points. I don't think that's the part about the scoring model that I do not like. You know, and sometimes people are like, well, you know, I'm not going to really worry about it. I've had cases like when I bought my first, you know, car after college, it was five years, and I'm like, whew, I ain't going to do that no more. But five years, I made every single payment. Now, I would be late sometime and get a late fee. Yeah. I, would pay, I would pay 28 days late. Yeah, you just maybe, don't go 30. Maybe 29, but I would never go 30. <laughs> and then I, and, and I, would, then I would see people, like, have, like, a credit card payment, and a birthday come up, or Christmas, or take a vacation. Well, I ain't going to worry about it. They, they'll just get it next time. I say, you can't do that. It ain't nothing but fifty dollars, man. Look, it's my birthday. I'm going out of town. Oh, it's Christmas. I ain't gonna really worry about it. So take your emotions out of it when you're talking about your credit. You know you can't do that because now if your score drops, now it's gonna put you in a different interest rate bracket, or you're gonna get declined. You know. It's so I tell just, people, it's not just like we were talking the other day. Your score pack affects a lot of things, like your insurance rates. Everything. You know, it affects so many things. And, and I think the biggest thing is people don't realize just like you compound interest on your investments, right. you compound interest on when you pay those high interest rates, even right. for a five-year car loan. If right. you could have financed it at 14, I'm making this up, obviously, 14%, you know, you got 14%, but you could have did it at 10 Right. So that's over. Like you're compounding that over five years. Right. And there's so many calculators. I did a video, I don't know, a YouTube thing. And I show people like, you have to do the numbers. Like in theory, sometimes you think things in your head. Right. But if you just do the numbers and see what it is, really. Right. Like how much you're going to save. Right. If you get it at the lower interest rate versus. Right. Yeah. But watch this, say one, one, one quick point. I, I know we got to get ready to wrap up. Yeah. Is that, is that also now when you, um, in terms of your score and your interest rate, you remember, remember when I said earlier, it's like you got, let's say, no, this is a good point. So let's say somebody got 4% on a car. The person who has a good score, they got 4%. 
I may ask them, I say, and so if you talk to them, they definitely don't want to hear nothing about no credit repair. <laughs> but then if they ever get a chance to like come to one of my seminars talking about credit education, they'd be like, wow. They'd be like, oh, okay, this, this is different. You know, okay, I do need to know some of these strategies. But I say, you got 4%, but you could have got two. And you do have a small percentage of consumers that they're very, very methodical. They're very, very tactful that I, I'm going to get 2% and not 4%. So I'll wait and see what I can do to get 10 more points. And we can talk about things where there's things you can do in 30 to 45 days to get. So does that boost thing really work? Well, it's, it's so much. I saw Hill Harper now. promoting that like a year or two ago. Yeah, it's, it's it's a lot of stuff out here now. I think it may. What's the name of it? It's called Credit Boosters. It's something like that. Like now, you can use your phone bill and all this other stuff to give your credit a boost. I saw him on um, I don't know. I don't even remember. I was watching something on YouTube and he was promoting it. I think for Experian or somebody. Yeah. He was saying because people are paying. He was like, people will pay their cell phone bill before anything else because they don't want to be without their cell phone. Right. It was like, so now you need to attach that to your credit report so you can start getting the payment history on it. Well, only I never did that, but I saw him talking about it. Well, it's definitely what they call it is alternative credit. So it's called alternative credit. So okay. now you do have the non-traditional credit cards, cars, banks, those traditional accounts and credit report. So now some businesses have a, have agreed to there are, did you know there, there are certain, there are a couple of, um, like, uh, like if you're renting a house or an apartment, there are a couple of um, organizations that the owner or the, the owner of the property, they can, uh, they can join these organizations and they can report your rent payments to your credit report, but you have to be a part of this network. Oh, I so, know yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. So, you know, you do have this, this, this if you're renting a house or an apartment, and if that landlord or owner is a part of a certain network, that can be reported on your credit report. So like a cell phone company, they would have to be, um, have the agreement with the network with Experian, like Facts and TransUnion, obviously oh, okay. like Sprint is not on your credit report. Um, now, um, I think T-Mobile used, it, it was one, it was like one credit card company, one cell phone company that will report on your credit report. You know, so it really just depends. And they did things like credit, you know, you can you can rent, you probably heard of it. Now you can do things like rent trade lines. Oh so like, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, huh? You say what? I said no, I didn't know that. Yeah, you can you can you can rent, you can rent like credit boosters. They got these, they got these new well now it used to be kind of parts of it was trickery, for lack of a better word. And then they evolved to, because they, you know, you, people were looking at ways to manipulate the model to boost your scores. Okay. So it was the same thing, like somebody can put you on as an authorized user, stuff like that, and kind of help, you know, with your score. Yeah, the score. And then, right, then people would take like a EIN number and move the dashes to make it look like a social security number to reinvent a total new profile. So you had people doing some crazy stuff out here. And then they... <laughs> And then they I just would, try to live my life by the rules. Yeah, and then they, and they, they will put like trade lines on there. And when I saw it, you know, you, you got a person that, and they would score with like punk, jump up 680 and 690. But then as a credit person who analyzed credit reports, I say, well, why is it that it's, it's showing you just opened it up maybe about a year ago and it's showing a high limit? It's just a way, it, see, the way it reported. But now, if you went to a place where when a score came out and you automatically got approved, they were out here get buying cars and you know getting two and three cars and you know and and subleasing them. They was manipulating the system. I say because if you get approved, where you know it, the score catches your the score catches your um you know, the computer catches your score and then determines your interest rate, but you're not dissecting and analyzing the report. A lot of for a while, a lot of financial institutions they, they lost a lot of money from fraud, and then people took a step back. So now they have these credit booster programs out here where you can they can put trade lines on there, and then some companies now they're using like CDs, as like a CD, it's you know like a secure like a secured installment loan. So they do have some legitimate companies out here 
And the only thing, instead of going to the bank and getting a secured loan to rebuild your credit, sometimes people are doing this one company, they're using CDs. And I'm like, okay, not but a secured loan, but they've actually managed to turn it into an actual business. And that's the thing, next time we can talk about steps of how you can um, reestablish. Uh, but the big thing, we won't say, hey, go to annualcreditreport.com. Right. Report, make things, make things, things are reporting properly. If you need to write a letter to the credit reporting agencies, you can add up to 100 words. I think that's very, very important. But there's things that we can do. And that's the thing that, you know, just one, one, a couple more points that even when I would talk to people who have like excellent credit, and sometimes people, I mean, it, it, it is empowering. People have a little ego. It is empowering to have great credit and great score. And I would ask them, say, well, I got good credit. I say, well, why? Well, I get approved for everything. So when I would say if they had the opportunity to come to one of my seminars, they will be kind of humble. Like, oh, okay. I say, you're getting approved for everything, but are you getting the best rates? And very quickly, it's like at a, at a dealership, you can be a 730 credit score, Sherry. And let's say you went to the dealership and you got a 2% on your, on your auto loan. And you like, now you know they got it going on. They got 2%. Yeah. But let's say they offered, was offering 0%. But now- Same as cash. Right. So when you, so watch this. Now, when you buy a vehicle, the sales guy makes his money on the price of the vehicle. But when you sign your contract, you go deal with the F and I manager, the finance manager. So they now they had a thing called like a interest rate yield spread or retail markup. So you can be approved at 2% and closed at 4% and you wouldn't even know it. But now once you got that 4%, I mean, you, I mean, you got it going on. It's like, look, what's your rate? 4%. What you paying? Oh, I'm paying 19%. I'm paying 16%. But now, and they were, they were, so, well, people can Google it, where they, 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 a lot of the consumer advocate groups was like, they, they exposed, you know, the retail markup, you know, so like I always tell people, you can, you can, you can, well, I got 3%, 4%, because I used to work at, I was a special finance manager at the dealership, so I knew that you could approve someone at five and close them at seven. But now, so what you do is you Google their rates to see, now everything is so access, Google their rates and see what they're offering. For then that way you can say your rates is saying that I should get three percent. So before I sign my contract, I'm looking for three percent. And that's why I tell high school students when you buy a vehicle, you ain't concerned about it. you know how much you can afford. What right. you're going to asking them is what are your what are your interest rates? Because that is a mistake I think. Well, I won't, a mistake, whatever, right? bad terminology. But people are always like how much of a note they can afford, and yeah, because they don't really look at. It. I, I don't think they look at the whole picture. It's like, I don't want to pay more than $500. Well, if you go in and tell somebody you want to pay more than $500, they're going to just get you to $500. <laughs> and if you're not looking at the numbers, how they got you there, then, like I said, for me, coming from the financial side, I would always go on a calculator, plug in, like you said, like I knew where the interest rates kind of were. I would kind of estimate with my credit score where I should come in. So I would know about where my note should come in. Right. And if they came in too much higher than that, I'm like, oh, see, now you're trying to play with me. Oh, hey, <laughs> and, 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 and I got this guy, I wouldn't buy a car from him because I told him I was like, he said, well, let me see what you did. I said, you don't need to see what I did. Right. I'm telling you that I know I shouldn't be more than this. And you coming in way up here. They, and they, so, you know, he, he kept wanting to see my little paper. I told him, I'm not going to show you my paper. Like, like I, why do you have to see my paper to quote me how much my note should be? And I tell people, when money is involved, it's not, it's, it's business. It's you business. Go, you go to a dealership, they be like, you want some coffee? You want some water? They want some cookies? Nice. <laughs> you want some cookies? They, they, they be, <laughs> why, I, buy, I buy all my cars from so-and-so. My thing is, are you, get, are you getting the best rate? So that's what we try with the education, you know, and working in the industry, you just making sure I'm getting a good deal. And I always tell young people, when money is involved, you have to force people to keep it real with you. Because when money is involved and that's how they make their living, they don't care. In some cases, they don't care if it's my brother, my sister, my cousin. When there's money involved and this is how I feed my family. And see, that's the thing, the thing like when it went to the, the, the mortgage crisis and when it came, we came out of that, now we, we must have full disclosure. 
Now you got to have four. They, on that good faith testament, they was doing two point loan origination. Oh, loan origination, loan discount. That's three points. Then a yield spread. You approved at six. We closed you at eight. So when it came out of the one of the big positive that came out of the foreclosure crisis was full disclosure on your good faith estimate, so you would know what all your fees are. That's a whole different topic that we can talk about. With somebody buying a house and yeah. then making sure that you know get your good faith estimate to see what your estimated closing costs are, because that's where they make their money line by line. They have discretion. So, you know, it's, and that's the thing when you're talking about, you know, stuff like that. And that's what I always wanted to do for people that when you walk away, just having a knowledge and having some strategy, then being able to break it down, like next time, even just, I can break the model down. I can spend an hour just on the model and really breaking it down. So that's why I tell kids, I say, look, before you're 21, learn the basis of this model. Then when you get finished, you will, like you said earlier, learn how to protect, maintain, sustain, and improve your score in direct relation to that model. And then I tell people, you got to be able to communicate your credit report to people, understanding not how to read it like myself, what I did, but you should be able to communicate the basics of your credit report because you never know when you're in a position, you're trying to do something very, very important. And you got to be uh, speaking confident. If they ask you questions, you can't be, you know, kind of vague and I'm not really sure. So I try to teach young people, you got to understand how to communicate your report to somebody because it's going to get to that point where people are going to ask you questions. So, so you see this how is much money you're spending. And I think, yeah, so, you know, if you want to come back on, because yeah. I think like going to the basic and if people understand, like not just the percentages, because I see the percentages all the time. Like it's made up of the, like you said, 35, you know, the percentages you said, but then also what that bucket record, you know, represents. There you go. There you go. Yeah, so, yeah you need to know the percentage and then right. and what that yeah. represents so that you know how to maintain it. Because like I said, life happens. Like with this, this happened to people, no fault of their own. Like it just happened. And now, now you got to try to recover from it. And then what's the best way? Because it's going to be small steps. You're not going to be able to do it overnight. It's going to take some time. You know, if your credit score was impacted, it will take some time. But it's going to take some time. And I always tell people that once you get to, I like to, I like to say real quickly before we cut off, I say, when you leave me, you're going to be okay because now you're going to have the, the education and the knowledge. Teaching them fish. Right. There you go. So when you, it's like, <laughs> I, I, and I got several people that was in the 500s after bankruptcy. And cause see, I don't do a lot of personal consultations cause I'm more like corporate collaborations. You know, me, sure. I'm, I, I do corporate collaborations and right. professional development training and stuff like that. But now, you know, and I can get my website, you know, um, and then once again, people go to my website and see who I've worked with, you know, state level, you know, federal. So if you want to say your website address, we can put it in the comments too. Yeah, it's uh, KS, uh, let me put, yeah, KS Credit Education, no, my bad, KS Education Solutions. It's real simple. I'm getting tongue tied. KS Education Solutions. Okay. Yep. KS Education Solutions. And, you know, I mean, you know, I've spoken, you know, nationally and different groups, you know, young adults, you know, tr public training, employee financial fitness. I mean, pretty much you name it, I've done it. And for me, once again, I, I get the, the, this is just, it just happens to be something that I know about because of my experience. And I'm and like, you've been encouraging me, Sherry, that I am going to maybe do a course online and maybe do some things on social media because I'm seeing all these people and I mean, and, and, and they do help some people, but you know, when somebody really have the knowledge. Yeah. And the other thing, so it, it will close out with, because a friend of mine recently who just relocated back to Detroit, like that people understand, because a lot of, like we talked the other day, people have this negative relationship with credit. But when she paid off all of her bills a few years ago, because she sold her house, so she took some of the proceeds, got rid she didn't use credit for three years. So she went to rent a house and they were like, you don't have any credit. And so she called me, she was like, I, I said, no credit is almost as bad as bad credit. Might be worse, I don't know. But I told her, I said, why didn't you just charge a few things, pay it off, charge a few things, pay it off. She said she thought not having any debt would be better. So after she paid everything off, she didn't use it again. 
So Sherry, that leads, leads me to my last point. So one I'm so proud of um, is that we're going to do a, uh, a, a, it's called a parent, uh, like a senior exit program or parent financial exit program for high school juniors and seniors, mm -hmm. or if they are freshmen or sophomore in college, and I give them a financial blueprint step-by-step step of how to establish credit. We're not promoting debt, how to leverage credit. So when you right. finish college, you're not coming back saying, mom, dad, would you co-sign for me? And I think too many times we're preparing kids academically and career and, and what school you want to go to and ACT, SAT, but then there's no financial blueprint. And I learned that from a guy in the industry that he helped his daughters get established. And that way, when they finished college, they were able to buy their own house, you know, get an apartment, you know, get a vehicle. So truly financially, financially leaving the nest. Right. So that's something that you and I, I want you to work on. Uh, I want you to come on board. I want to talk about that because, you know, I want people to understand that we got to put a financial blueprint in place, you know, for our kids, not advocating debt, but how to strategically leverage debt, leverage credit, and how to utilize credit. So, you know, people in America have been able to utilize and leverage the credit to become millionaires, build wealth. So why is it in the country, we have it down to a science of leveraging credit to help build this country, but on the consumer side, we don't really get, 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 that, get that art and that science of leveraging credit. A lot of us do, but it should be more in abundance. You know, so that big time, you know, not big time, but that financial transition program for parents, juniors, seniors, sophomores, and then the parents say, I'm going to do one, two, three. This is what I'm going to do. And one of the last thing I'll say, we got to go ahead and go. I tell, <laughs> high, I tell the high school students, I say, before you 21, I want you to learn the basics about this model. So I take financial literacy. They say financial literacy. I say financial education. So when I teach high school students, Sherry, you know, too, they love it when I come. They'd be like, oh, my goodness. You're giving us, like, what we got to do and, like, the application. The right. other stuff, the, the, what, we, what we be learning in school, personal finance, and, you know, what, and some programs I've went through, I teach them that, okay, when I get finished with you, you're going to know how to make some moves and you're going to be educated. Right. Because you do, like, like, you know, we'll wrap it up, but there's a time and place for it. That's just what people right. need to realize. There's right. a time and place for it, and you just need to understand it so that you don't abuse it. Right. Yep. So, you know, uh, uh, the puppy, we got a puppy. So, you know, Scott. So it's time for you to go. And I appreciate yeah. you coming on. Right. I, I, heard, I, I heard her and they're saying, you know, stop Rocco. Stop. And then I, everything is quiet. So I got to go in there and see what's going on. <laughs> But I love you. We'll hey, come back you. another time and yes, uh, finish yes. up. But I think this was a good start. Yeah, peace and love. You know, um, you know, I don't mind saying that. You know, Sherry been knowing me, you know, all my life since I was a, a young boy, and um, you know, she know I love her and think so highly of her. And you and I'll talk um, um, by next by by next by, by next Friday. Yeah, we'll talk again. So you go take care of the new edition. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Hope, hope you learned something. KS, Education Solutions, and I will see you all next time. See you, Sherry. Love you, sweetie. Uh, all right. See you. Love you, too. All right. Bye. So I think that was a relatively good start to our general conversation about credit. Um, the, Kevin and I have known each other for years since we were young, you know, skating at the local skate rink. And so he and I have both decided that he should come back again and kind of break down specifically some different areas of the credit score model, different things that you can do with your credit report. So we will do additional videos sometime in the future. I don't have an ETA, but I think today was a good start on just a general discussion and to give you some how-to tips to maybe things that you can do to improve your credit score whether you whether it occurred this past year or not because the tip about writing something on your credit reports so that your creditors are aware that was an aha moment for me i was not aware of that so don't forget to subscribe to the channel comment below on your take on what was discussed and whether or not you have questions the link to kevin's website will be in the description 
Don't forget to hit the notification bell and give it a thumbs up. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Thank you for supporting my channel.